we'll have to get the uh, evening moving. And not everybody is registered this year just yet. So just my little preamble will give those uh, Australians a bit of a chance to get in here. Um, before getting into that, a little bit of housekeeping. I have to tell you the exits are all well signed and that there are male and female toilets on this level, and male and female other end, and my toilets here and downstairs as well. You can appreciate that. My name is Dennis Doyle, I'm a member of the Cruising Committee. This is the Cruising Committee initiative to bring this evening to you, this information evening to you. And I have to plug our upcoming events to start with. Uh, we have a Christmas bash garden committee meeting, a chance to meet the committee and uh, other cruising members of the club, which will be in the running room on December the 6th. Uh, we'll be finger food and uh, it should be a nice, casual, informative affair that you can uh, get to know on the other cruises, although looking around here, there's some pretty highly qualified navigators in that here. So um, anyway, that's of interest to you. Um, Ted Knox, a uh, member of our committee, is organising a, a Newcastle cruise or a rendezvous in Newcastle in early January, and that'll be in company with uh, Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron, RPA, and other sailors. That could be quite an interesting event with some uh, business to wineries and so forth, and like-minded sailors. Uh, there will be a, uh, for those boats cruising to Hobart, uh, for the Wooden Boat Festival, one to participate in it too, to just simply attend. Probably the uh, best uh, Wooden Boat Festival going. Uh, it's, it's just incomparable, that event. And we'll be having a dinner, a spirit of cruising dinner, at the Shipwrights Arms on the 9th of February. Uh, and any boats, Go to that. Uh, are quite welcome to contact me. Let me know that they're going down there, and we'll get them on the list for dinner. And uh, perhaps we can organise uh, a get together beforehand, where all can share their plans for how they're travelling, and perhaps have some rendezvous together on the way as they make their way down there. Look out for that. That will be posted on the website soon. Uh, now down to business. We've got tonight Mike Prince, uh, the Director of Chartered Services for the Australian Hydrographer's Office. Uh, he's going to unlock a lot of the secrets uh, around electronic charting. And uh, Mike and his office are responsible for the official charts. Understand that official charts. All others are not official. Um, He's uh, able to assist by Peter Gallagher and uh, Wayne Gallagher from uh, Boat Books has uh, set out here with uh, quite a few pamphlets and information for uh, those uh, programs and access to those charts and because Boat Books are the official distributor for the official charts, those paper charts that you want to carry on board are mandated uh, or bought through Boat Books and so are the electronic charts, and I'll bear that in mind for the future. And uh, I guess you've seen on our promotion this rather dramatic photograph of Team Vestas, uh, which will definitely shows the consequences of not looking close enough at your uh, unofficial chart. Uh, and uh, we all are aware of other dramatic GPS-assisted groundings where this details of uh, bits that stick up and aren't shown. So, without any further ado, uh, Mike Prince from the Hydrographer's Office uh, allow him to, I guess, talk to us for about an hour and then he will invite questions from the floor. Oh, one more question. Uh, uh, can I have a show of hands on about how many might be staying over for dinner? Bistro's open uh, until about 9 o'clock, but yeah, that's what we'll pretty good turn out there. Four, eight, two, four, 20 odd there. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, your phones are off, of course, and uh, now we'll get on with it. And uh, Mike Prince, thank you. Thank you.
think of the press there, you would notice that no longer says RA in. We're no longer part of the Australian Navy on 1st of July this year. Okay. Yes, as I said, uh, one of my grids, I basically run the national sign of the high traffic service. We also have a defence sign, we've got another director, and then we have the CEO in part as well. Uh, with me, I've got Peter Gallagher. Peter Gallagher, the world's most famous yachtsman, according to him. He's disappearing on leave when he's not sort of going on his own. He occasionally does some work. He's also one of our senior cartographers. Okay, what I want to cover quickly, just a little bit about biographic service. Which charts am I talking about? Which charts am I talking about that you should not necessarily be quite so um, trusting with? A checklist to help you get through what to do, when, that sort of thing, and where you can find some more information. And the 
the seafarers came onto the Australian waters. It's not like a, a pile of sand directions. This one's had a navigating bureaucracy. It's not how to navigate through the rocks. So if you want to find out who to call, when to call, how to call a port, that sort of thing, that's all you refer to. If you want to find out how to figure out how good your charts get, you look in me. We can check by the download. As I say, those ones don't exist anymore. We stopped in 2013. The main ones we produce, as I say, paper nautical charts, we've been running them since 1942. 1946 became a national job rather than a wartime job, and we've been going ever since. In 2001, we started making electronic navigational charts based upon what the International Maritime Organization was after. It was all driven by the Exxon Valdez, which you might remember. Uh, world's biggest oil spill at the time in 1989. It's now not even in the top 50. However, PNCs simply trigger alarms. That's the biggest thing to remember. And all those alarms do have stopped running around. One thing you might notice, the diagram of all the paper charts at the top one, Diagram of all the ANCs and the bottom one are very, very different. You can't find a paper equivalent and electronic equivalent that are direct one for one. Content is, but the shape and limits are not. We'll get back to that. Paper ones, you have gold date by hand, you will be familiar with notices to mariners, those horrible things that come out every fortnight. Uh, ANCs, you update via download. Again, fortnightly, but you basically plug it in and should then update. One of the main differences is paper charts, quite simply, a static image. You're not going to do anything with them. They are made for a particular purpose. There's a compromise there always between the extent, how far you want to cover on the ground, versus the size of the piece of paper, versus the level of detail. Electronic charts, we don't have that limitation. The latest electronic charts aren't either square or rectangular. They just follow the shape of the port. We just don't have those constraints anymore. Okay, give you an example. This is what they're really made for. This is a ship called the Shen Ping. April 2010. You might possibly remember it supposedly taking a shortcut in the Great Barrier Reef and running it around. It actually didn't take a shortcut. It was told following a normal recommended track but it still can crop. What they were doing was they come out of Gladstone, the first officer had been away for 37 hours at that point. He had the watch going into port, he supervised all the loading, got about an hour's sleep in the middle of the night, and then he was away again. They sailed in the afternoon, about lunchtime, and having disembarked the pilot at about three in the afternoon, they then basically set off to go out through one of the entrances out through the barrier reef. The original track was the black one. Look at this. On the other side. Oh dear, one minute to go. 
changed because of an oncoming cyclone. Uh, so they're under a bit of time pressure and all that sort of thing. Okay, well, look, that's unfortunate, but it happens. But you should still be able to rely on your charts and your systems. If you look there, you do expect to see the information. So we're using, uh, again, unfortunately, we've seen that charts on uh, bespoke systems. So that's what they saw. They thought 46 metres deep, uh, not a problem. And they assumed that all the way through. First trigger should have been, is a territorial sea limit. The territorial sea limit goes around a lump of land. So where's the lump of land? The answer is, it's not there. Or the reef there. That's not there either. In contrast, the official chart at the same scale, there's all the lumps of land and there's a reef underneath it. Should be setting your alarm bells. And that's the comment out of the investigation. <coughs> wasn't actually the scene that had to put the lump of land in there or the reef in there, but the way they had encoded it, it didn't appear. If you zoomed in because the yacht is in a particular place and then moved along because you've sailed somewhere, it didn't appear. You had to zoom in directly on the reef for it to appear. So there's just a functional problem going on. In contrast, the ENC don't work that well. If you zoom in, you get it. That's actually the detail in the ENC when you zoom in. So the full details there on the official one. That's actually an Indian one. This is an area where all the official charts overlap. There's British charts, French charts, and Indonesian. Oh, sorry, part of Indian. So, as I say, if you're going to use the license chart, cross-check these the official ones. Even the small scale, map of the world type one would have alerted somebody to the fact that there was a lot of reef there. Second one, if you're going to carry charts, try and get them at least the current edition. Preferably, try and get them up to date. This is one that we published in 2000. This is the paper chart version. Uh, it was copied again, sneak back, unfortunately, uh, by then in 2002. Okay, fair enough. Two year lag, but they got an update. 2007, a time chair chartered by an owner still hadn't updated to the latest version of Sigma chart. So, Sigma is not a fault of my evidence. The chartered by an owner is the one who took a five year delay getting his chart to date. The skipper, not the chartered by an owner, took his out during the day, quit fishing over at Stratford Island, came back in the dark. <coughs> the ship's in the channel. So, okay, we'll stay out of the channel. Uh, came down outside the channel and basically that was his plan. Unfortunately, that was what was there. <laughs> his knowledge of navigation and knowledge of lights and all the rest of it was also appalling. The judge at the inquest was telling him what the lights meant. Unfortunately, in this instance, somebody actually got it. They actually hit it at 30 knots in the dark and it basically went through the windscreen. So, as I say, the list of the current edition, that would be great. It also was not the only vessel there. <coughs> and you get them. Quite simply, we've got a bunch of fact sheets. They are here. All the how on how to update things is in those fact sheets. I won't try and explain it. These things just read in your own time if you want to, and if you already know it, then that's great. Third, if you're using a chart plot, set it at a decent scale. Then vary that scale. Don't just stay locked into one view. Picture your in-car navigation system. If you've got it set to something that only shows you two streets, you might eventually find the address, but you have no idea what sort of you're in. Same sort of thing applies here. 
This fellow, the other way back, was sailing around on a view that looked like this. Never the world type stuff. Unfortunately, he was heading straight for Elizabeth Reef. On this one, you barely even see it. It's a tiny dot. But at six miles across, that's what it looks like. Because he only looked at that view all the way across the uh, Coral Sea, he hit it, destroyed it. Nancy rescue effort, frigates and helicopters, all sorts of things going through it. So don't just pick one scale and think that's going to do it really well. Next one, fix your position regularly. It might seem like a no brainer, but people quite often get this wrong. Uh, as a rough rule of thumb, about half the time interval is going to take for you to get into, into danger. So if you're eight miles off, you're doing four knots, fix your half an hour, something like that. Simple example, this guy didn't. That was his second grounding in six months. Sailors to power, but the techniques of Spain didn't change. The 
I basically told them to big piece of rope with a lump of lead on the end, a lump of lead line, and knots all down. People measured how many knots went down to the water. And they did yell out some very gun ho sort of phrase and basically said how big it was. The point was, it was a single spot sounding. No idea what was either side of those spots. The depth where they measured it was perfect, but if it was just five feet from something else, if I dropped it here, I wouldn't know that was there. And so on, drop another one over there, I wouldn't know the lectern was here. From 1940, with the um, advent of sonars for chasing submarines, somebody decided it wouldn't be a good idea to point it straight down. So they did, and that became the first echo sounders. The first echo sounders used in Australia were actually in 1939. Uh, the technology didn't change up until about the mid-1970s. And in simple terms, the ship ran backwards and forwards at a certain line spacing and collected a profile of the seabed. So along that profile, good detail, no idea what's between the lines. But you can prove that by narrowing down the space between the lines. From 1971 onward, we started towing something called a solid scan sonar. It's a little like looking at a mountain range in the distance. It won't tell you how high the mountain is, but you can certainly see that there's one there. Well, we can see that there's missing details that go back so far. Those missing details might be a container, it might be a rock, uh, it might be a, a wreck. All these things get picked up, then you go back and look. The latest ones, called the multi beam echo sounder, it's like dragging a gun and rake through the water that way. It picks up everything. So, pretty much no chance of anything being missed. So, that's the Rolls Royce, that's the modern standard. That's common, that's common, that is still more of a number. So that's what we get from the Rolls Royce version. That's what a multi beam survey looks like. You can see all the runs where it's gone backwards and forwards. Uh, and then roofs and so on. However, the opposite end of the spectrum, but that sort of thing, that dates from about the turn of the last century. About 65% of Australian waters still need to be resurveyed. That's in the minority. So it becomes important to know how accurate and how reliable the charts are. If anybody has sailed up the Torres Strait, you might know that there's a rock called OG Rock. That ship is the Ocean Ranger. That's what the rock's named after. And what day? Anyway, so that's OG Rock. That's the east end of Torres Strait, right in the middle of the shipping route. Uh, it was found in 1971, and that was why we used the first site to get sonar. But the trick is, what's between all the, all the soundings? That's what you really need to know. Is there nothing between them, or is that just a representation and the coverage in between is actually really good? Well, that's what's really there between the soundings that you're used to seeing on the chart. <coughs> way more detail. In fact, that's a subset of the survey. That's about one thousandth of what we collected. So, accuracy of survey is this sort of thing. How much noise is there in the seabed? How much motion of the ship? All that sort of stuff. The bit that really matters is that tiny dot there. That is OG Rock. That's the one that needs to see the ship. That's the one that really matters. That in survey terms, it's called seasonal coverage or feature detection. We show these things these days by only one system. There's a couple of other ones around the world on paper charts. On electronic charts, everybody has adopted the one system. Oddly enough, it was actually developed by Australians. It's something called zones of confidence. In simple terms, there's four 
money categories, A, B, C, and D. A is split to brilliant, being pretty close to brilliant, so it's A1 and A2. And at the very bottom is one that says undersexed. We haven't got around to it yet. On a paper chart, you see this sort of mosaic somewhere in the corner, you know, bottom left corner, top right corner, something like that. The same system is used on the electronic chart, it's just displayed a little differently. <coughs> you'll see the C floor coverage is the biggest single box. That's the thing that says we did detect deadly or we did detect. <coughs> so give you some examples. Here's ones where the zone of confidence is B, which is good. You know, for all intents and purposes, you can put your faith in it. So it's the shipping route. Makes sense? All the soundings are italic. On paper chart, they're all relatively close together, all the contours are one solid line. Then you get over here, off the beaten track, the sand to be a bit of regular. That's a single line because of a single low width there. The contours are all dashed. Uh, bigger spaces are white, that sort of thing. You see it reported in there. Very nice letter from the fellow who hit that one. So <laughs> Uh, but honestly, you don't take a two metre draft yacht into two metres of water at six o'clock at night and expect to get away with it. Uh, so in 2008, he found out that you're right, you shouldn't. Another example, a troll boat went to anchor up here. This was a survey done by the Department of Transport WA. That's what I'm just there. Uh, he was trying to anchor in here about 30 metres of water. You can just start to see all the dash contours and so on, right where he was going to stop. So he's going from good into the one that's sort of in a bit dodgy. So that's where he was trying to stop. After the event, that's where we found that it was actually there. That rises to not five metres off the sea. Scared the hell out of him. So that's from the second survey by Department of Transport WA. So that's what you get when you're not particularly confident in the survey. <coughs> but at its most extreme, we go from A, B, C to D. D for dangerous, that's the only way to remember it. C for caution, that's fine, sort of. Uh, D, dangerous. This area down here, you've got to wonder, how big can an undetected feature be? Well, if somebody's going to find something that rises to zero when it's 22 metres just beside it, there must be things there the size of massive chimneys coming off the sea. So you've got to be fairly cautious to go in, or at least you want to be. And yet, this is fairly popular cruising territory. This is up around the Kimberleys. Uh, this bit here, really well sounded, especially that shoulder. <laughs> As I say, if it says inadequately survey, it really means it's inadequately surveyed. If it's got lots of things that say reported and nothing to back it up, for every one that's there, it's probably another two or three that are not on the chart but do exist. So a couple of clues from paper charts. If it's in, you know, good snapping of soundings, solid contours, uh, then it's fine. We do that in areas that are zone of confidence A1, A2, B, and the upper end of zone of confidence C. Well, as long as it's the poorest stuff, it's going to broken contours. Get worse, we simply don't know where the contour goes. Completely unsurveyed, it just says so. We know nothing about that area. Again, back to the same example. If we now look at an electronic chart, the same message is there. That's what it looks like an electronic chart for the same area. It means the same thing, but the symbology has changed from 
A's and B's and C's in a little diary in the corner to be spread across the chart and it works well like a hotel. If there's five stars, it's great. Four stars, good. Three stars, maybe you don't want to stay there. Two stars, avoid it. So just think of hotels. That's actually a layer that can be switched on and off if you're trying to chart. The idea would be look at it, check where you should be going, turn it off, get out of the way. If you're going somewhere off, the, off your plane track, turn it back on again, have a look, assess it, turn it off again. So again, the higher the number of stars, the better it is. It also has the similar sorts of cartographic clues uh, as the paper chart. Solid contours, dashed contours, really broken contours, and unsurveyed. The only difference would be for approximate soundings on the electronic chart, there's a circle around. On the paper chart, it was the upright soundings, rather than metallic. On the electronic, the circle around. Finally, place forward, look out of the boat. Hopefully you guys do, but an awful lot of you should have do not. They get mesmerised by what's on the screen. A couple of examples of people who do not. <laughs> I really like that one. The name of the boat is Temporary Insanity. <laughs> Mythbusters tried to replicate that. Right. On to just about the electronic charts. As I said, the electronic chart coverage is not the same limits per chart as the paper charts. We simply divide it into regular uh, 30 degree, 10 degree, and 1 degree squares. The, the number of any E and C is the latitude and longitude in the southwest corner, bottom left corner. So we'll say AU for Australia. It will say what scale B it's in, I'll come to that shortly, but it's 1 to 5. And then the next 5 digits are 2 for latitude, 3 for longitude. Scale bands, we have 19 different scales of paper chart. The idea being, you've got to try and fit the right picture on the right side piece of paper. You can't make a piece of paper as big as a picture. Electronic charts, on the other hand, our only limit ultimately is 5 megabytes. That's it, file size. So we can make them as big or as small as we like. So, number 19, it's only 5 here. We're working on the 6th one as we speak. But, overview, map of the world type stuff, the entire Indian Ocean, that sort of thing. In our case, 30 degrees by 30 degrees. And about the same level of detail as the international paper charts. Next one, 10 by 10, that's about the equivalent of the Coral Sea, the Timor Sea, the Arafura Sea, that sort of thing. And again, about the same level of detail as the big scanning of the international charts. Three and four, both one degree squares, same level of detail as the Coastal Series charts. These ones, at their worst, the same scale as the paper charts for the ports. At their best, about, what, six or eight times better, roughly. The level of detail going into it now is just far away better than the paper charts. Within each band, you can zoom in and out, but you do get to a point where, as you zoom in, the next layer of detail will actually kick in and replace it over the top. There's also variable content. All the content is programmed in. You don't necessarily have to look at it all the time. That's actually the middle of the display. That's a piece of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, the two way roads going up inside. And that's what's decreed by the International Maritime Organization. So, rough equals white bit for this vessel is safe water, blue bit, bearing in mind the draft of the ship is dangerous water, it's too shallow, and green bits brief. Those funny screw head things 
and nasty things to the point. Or you can turn on a layer, this starts to look more like the chart you're probably used to. Turn on soundings in this case. Turn on the other routes. So that's the designated shipping area where it's legally obliged to stay within as compared to reports to stay within. If you're interested in fishing, turn on the marine reserve limits. You might want to turn off all the other layers. You don't have them all on. Just pick and choose what you want. You can also change the pallets for night and day and lots of stuff as well. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of combinations that are possible. And it will depend on the software that's within whatever system you're using. But all the information is there, customised to the art of the data. We distribute these through two paths. The, the paper charts, we made the original ones. The British copy them. Lots of other people illegally copy them, but the British copy them legally. In comparison, there is only one version of any electronic chart. It's the one we make. Nobody copies it. It is the same one. The only thing that is changing is who you buy it through. So you can buy it through Boat Books, we're at Wayne City, and he has uh, a supply arrangement for the Australian cheap path, which will give you local ENC coverage. If you're going further abroad, that same ENC, that identical ENC, is in the British service, uh, who, who join together from all sorts of nations um, and provide worldwide coverage, as do all these other distribution agencies. So they've actually got about 80% of the world's business. So that's the UK ad royalty. Uh, they, have, by the way, have nothing to do with the royalty. Absolutely zero. Penalty is a brand. Other ones, Chart Code, Chart World, Data. Some of these will license them, provide them to you under completely different terms. So the UK one, you might say, buy one back B and C for three months, six months, nine months, four months, that sort of thing. And you'll buy it up front. Some of these other ones, you don't buy them up front at all. Look at them to your heart's content. Plan you know, your entire world cruise. You don't pay for them until the day you steam across it or sail across it. So you might look at 10 times as many as you actually use. So you don't have to stick to that supply. Having said that, you really do have a pretty good reputation and I'm sure why not back it up. Uh, as I say, they are not the only one, and it's the same electronic chart no matter which service you go to. The one difference between these, the national service and the international, frankly, is the price. We wanted something that was cheap and very easy to access. Uh, more than anything, we wanted to undercut our own raster chart series, simply to move people on it. Uh, so we priced it, frankly, cheaper than that. At their cheapest, they're about $1 each. At the cheapest through the Admiralty, they're probably close to $30 each. Same means to So if you're staying local, honestly, you're nuts to not use the local one. If you are going overseas, out to the strange area, you're going to have to go to one of those. So the local service, we've divided it just into simple areas. You can either get the lot if you want. Most people, on the other hand, actually get coastal areas. So those are all coastal areas. There's about 70 ENCs in each. And the idea is that you don't have to pick and choose which ENCs. You just say, I want this area here. Give me a reading in that area. And we give you a reading in that area for about a dollar each. Uh, we did design port packs for the marine pilots. They don't buy them. They buy them least. A dollar each, why not? Um, yeah, and, and that's roughly the sort of costs. We've also designed some of them specifically with your races in mind. So there's packs that go two ways down here, for example, Sydney and Hobart, Melbourne and Hobart, uh, and, and so on. If you want to go to the water, <coughs> that's there about these sorts of things, we've been going to boat shows and so on for years, and the same questions keep coming up. So what we 
we started doing was just writing down the answers. These are all three things on our website. There are a couple of pages each. Uh, and they just fact sheets on whatever we have been asked that people want to spread answer. So if you want to know about official charts versus unofficial charts, there's a fact sheet. If you want to know how to figure out how good or bad a piece of chart action is through zones of confidence, there's a fact sheet on it. If you want to know how to correct your charts, there's a fact sheet on it. And so on. So that's really the source of information that we need to refer to. We've brought along some of them to um, If you want to grab it, please feel free. If you just want to download it another time, that's fine too. But they are designed for you. They're not really designed for big ships. They're designed for people who are just want some casual information. Yeah. A simple example would be, that's the fact sheet for chart symbology. It's got a chart and a bunch of explanations on it. That's the fact sheet on the ENC symbology. Uh, every symbol explained. That's it there. The word for one. Um, so feel free if you want to download them. There is no charge whatsoever. And that is it.
it's not, or you can set the three lines. You can set the width of the cone. You can set corridors down the side, this sort of thing. Basically, you create this buffer zone all around you. And anything that you can hit, it'll send up an alert saying that you're hitting something. No, if, if there is something there to hit, it will set off the alert. It does to a certain extent, yes. What does that mean? You, you, you do get what you pay for. There are some uh, uh, electronic charging systems that you can get that are free on the internet, and you get what you pay for. Uh, I might know my former watch what need is running around one of the brand. It's a little rough and ready, but I think costing $250 odd dollars. Uh, on the other hand, the stuff that's uh, coming from both books for that, Books, but the stuff on load books is actually quite good. It uh, starts at about $700, I think, or thereabouts. Uh, and it really is one of the better ones. Uh, there are also some systems that run on uh, iPads now, which are actually very good. Uh, they're effectively portable pilotage units. Portable pilotage units have some pretty high standards. Uh, all they've done is they've taken it out of the platform and said, here's the application, put on your own system. So, you get what you pay for, you, the more you pay for, the better functionality you're going to get. I use both uh, Navionics and CMAP <coughs> charts. Is there any way of knowing, looking at those charts, uh, how uh, frequently they've been updated? Absolutely not. And in your experience, how frequently do they get updates from you? Uh, we give them to them every month. We see the results sometimes once a year. Uh, and often there's a bit of time lag in that too. Uh, so, you know, for example, where they're two or three years out of date. Uh, honestly, yeah, they're, they're marketing them, uh, you know, things like CMAP Professional. Uh, but there are some pretty good iPad ones out there as well, too. Uh, 